So Borada, and welcome to this joint Cardiff University and Durham University webinar. The reason for organising this webinar jointly and the reason why it's so timely is that the changes coming down the track to regional development funding will have a profound impact on some of the regions and nations of the UK, particularly Wales and the northeast of England. The UK government's new internal market bill is clearly going to change the landscape in significant ways. And we hope that through the insights offered by our panel today, we can give policymakers a deeper understanding of some of the issues, as well as some real life examples of how regional development funding can drive local economies. We have a distinguished panel. First to speak in a moment will be Professor Kevin Morgan, Professor of Governance and Development, Cardiff University. Kevin is one of the leading experts in regional economic development and has been a prominent voice in post-evolution Wales on how to grow the Welsh economy in a sustainable way. Kevin will be followed by Professor Louise Bracken, Director of the Water Hub at Durham University, where she has engaged with small and medium-sized enterprises in the northeast of England to identify and develop innovative practical solutions to challenges in the region's water sector. The project is funded by the European Regional Development Fund, and as such, Louise can offer a really interesting first-hand account of the impact of regional development funding. And finally, we will hear from Professor Carl Coleman, Head of the Department of Chemistry at Durham, at Durham University. The COAST project, which Carl heads up, enables postdoctoral students to take on research placements in SMEs in the Northeast, who would otherwise struggle to afford new product development. The project is funded through European structural funds, so again, we'll give you a sense of the real challenges existing projects may face in the months ahead. Thanks, Claire. I've been asked to speak about the Shared Prosperity Fund and its implications for research and innovation funding on the one hand and territorial integrity in the United Kingdom uh, on the other hand. As regards the Shared Prosperity Fund, the SPF as we call it, there's not actually a great deal one can say simply because it doesn't exist. Uh, not yet anyway, and we're expecting further details to emerge in the comprehensive spending review. But whatever form it takes, uh, we can already say that it will need to address four key issues. Firstly, it will need to address the, what we call the quantum uh, issue, the scale and size of the budget, because government have promised the regions and nations of the UK that they won't be a penny worse off from what they were already receiving from European funds. The second issue is what we call the allocation issue. Will the funds be allocated on the basis of a needs-based formula, or will it be a challenge-based formula using competitive bidding? The third issue is the timescale issue. Will the funds be allocated like the structural funds on the basis of a multi-annual seven-year development cycle or will they be allocated in terms of a much shorter UK-based cycle which is common in the spending review cycles. And the fourth and final issue and, and probably the most combustible issue of all is the governance issue. How will these funds be managed and controlled? Will it, will it be a centrally managed fund run from Whitehall? Or will it be a devolved fund as the, as the current structural funds are uh, in, 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 in all the nations of the United Kingdom? These four issues, as you can tell, are enormously important for every part of the United Kingdom. But there's no part, in my view, where they are more significant than here in Wales, simply because Wales is currently the major beneficiary of the structural funds. And this is especially true with respect to uh, research and innovation funding. And sadly, this isn't a widely known uh, issue, but if we think of the ERDF, the European Regional Development Fund, for example, that brings around 334 million pounds to Wales in the current programming period uh, in terms of its funding for research and innovation to all parts of Wales. But on a per capita basis, the Welsh figure is five times greater than the UK average 
and it's nearly 10 times greater than the figure for England. So you can see the enormous imbalance, the asymmetry, if you will, in terms of the, the spatial significance of European funding for research and innovation. Back in 2017, Graham Reid was commissioned to produce a report on the government funding of research and innovation in Wales. And he produced an, an excellent report. Uh, I give evidence to that report. And one of the issues that I discussed and indeed argued with Graham was his point, whereby he said the loss of ERDF funding for research and innovation could be compensated in Wales if Wales got its act together and secured new RI funding from UKRI with its new six billion a year budget. Now, in principle, that's true. But in practice, it's very, very difficult. Why? Because it conceals one enormous difference between ERDF and UKRI. And that is to say, the allocation method. ERDF allocates money on the basis of social need. UKRI allocates money on the basis of open competition based on technical excellence. And there is no way I don't believe that Wales could compensate for all this money by moving from one fund uh, to the other. And this has an enormous effect on, on Welsh universities, for example, not only in terms of its impact on our research capacity in Wales, but it also impacts on our capacity to engage in public engagement, for example, the ways in which universities now act as place-based anchor institutions in terms of their regional uh, economy. Time was when Russell Group universities were pretty impervious to place. They framed their identities in international terms. But over the last decade or so, they have become increasingly place focused and they've developed what I'd call a spatial sensibility. For example, here in Cardiff, we have a very, very strong, very robust civic mission. And that civic mission uh, commits us to promoting the, the health, wealth, and well being of our communities. Our communities, both near here in Wales and far. We, we're active in Southern Africa, uh, for example. So, getting the SPF right, getting research and innovation funding affects not just research labs, but it affects the capacity of a university to engage in its regional economy and society, and the stakes are very, very high. And that brings me to my third and final theme, the impact on territorial integrity more generally in the United Kingdom. We have to remember that the Shared Prosperity Fund is one part, indeed quite a small part, of a wide tapestry of spatial policies in the United Kingdom. One of those policies has been referred to in the past as the common frameworks, which has been a bit of a wonkish debate about what will be done for common regulations to govern the UK single market post-Brexit. Issues to do with public procurement rules, state aid, phytosanitary standards, so on and so forth. Suddenly, those issues, which have been backroom issues, have been propelled to the front pages, as we know, because of the Internal Market Bill, which receives its second reading in Parliament uh, later today. The Internal Market Bill has hit the headlines because the government has decided to break the law on our external relationships. But the devolved administrations have been claiming that that bill also breaks the law on our internal relationships that govern the four nations of the United Kingdom. Welsh government, in my view, has been totally exemplary in dealing with these issues. Let, let me close with two examples. On the Shared Prosperity Fund, Welsh government was the first government in the United Kingdom to mobilize a wide and inclusive stakeholder community to design a new kind of regional policy, a more inclusive regional policy 
than we've seen in any part, I would argue, of the United Kingdom to date. It was the first government to mobilize that uh, stakeholder community. And secondly, it's been the first government to propose ways of keeping the United Kingdom together in terms of respecting the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. Our First Minister, Mark Drakeford, uh, our Council General, Jeremy Miles, have inundated Whitehall over the past few months with requests and proposals on how to design our common standards of the United Kingdom in a more mutually inclusive and democratic way. All of those overtures, to my mind, have been rebuffed in Whitehall uh, in favour of a much more top-down uh, unilateral approach to the way in which the UK will be governed post-Brexit. Our First Minister has now said that this Whitehall stance threatens the integrity of the United Kingdom, the four nations of the United Kingdom. And that's, uh, that shows that um, the stakes could not be higher when a politician who is committed to the union, Mark Drakeford and Welsh Labour are committed to the union, when people of that calibre are concerned about the future territorial integrity of our country. And on that point, Claire, I'll stop and hand over to Louise. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about a much more sort of more practical application of ERDF um, funding. I think some of the benefits to um, our regional economy. So I'm briefly going to outline the Water Hub as a project and think about um, its impact that it's delivered. The purpose of the Water Hub really as we, we set this up was very much to open up markets related to water in the environment sector for SMEs, um, establish a new collaboration to develop and embed innovative solutions coming out from those SMEs into our partner organisations and then provide access to opportunities to test products in real world settings um, join up with research institutes and work with um, government organisations. So it was very much a partnership approach. Um, so I'm going to go back to that first slide. So it was a partnership between Durham University, Northumbrian Water, the Environment Agency, Durham County Council. So it was part funded by ERDF, but actually all of those um, partners were contributing match funding as well. Um, we were very much targeting two particular types of SMEs, the digital SME community that we've got a quite a rich um, cohort in the northeast here in England, and again the more traditional water environment sector SMEs, but again often not finding ways into those um, supply chains of our partners. Um, and the project duration ran from August 2017 to June 2020, so we've, we've recently just finished. Um, and the way we, the spirit of this collaboration really was really based on open innovation. So what we were doing, we were taking the water sector knowledge that we had across the partners and the environmental knowledge. We were using that with each other to, to spin off these sort of challenges, I suppose, challenge generation, where we knew that all the partners had challenges that they needed solutions to. And we were trying to put those out to SMEs to then um, help us with really. We'd have some time then exploring these, blending sort of the ideas from the organisations and the partners and the SMEs in practice to see what would work. And then we were very much focused on these practical applications. So thinking about using homes as test sites, maybe using laboratories if there was extra um, developmental work needed, but really thinking about the supply chains of our organisations as, as drivers, but also ways to take up and embed solutions. So we had a series of small grants and then we had time for mentoring and facilitation. So the headlines of what we managed to produce is we actually worked with 163 SMEs in total over our time. We had about 1800 hours of, of events and networks um, which people could then attend and join in. Um, we operated very much a roll on roll off model of support. I know some of these type of projects say you have to sort of only access um, 12 hour support, but we had SMEs that maybe just came for one hour, but others that came to about 50 hours of work with us. So people kept coming back, I think, as, they, as the opportunities mapped on to what they wanted to do. We had 51 SMEs that would provide at least 12 hours of support. And we hosted about 28 events, sponsored or co-sponsored with our organised, um, the organisations we were working with. So it was quite busy. We had eight grants that were awarded to SMEs. We had about 20 that engaged in research collaborations then with um, people across university. 
we have four products that were new to market and 12 that were then new to firm um, and actually seven new jobs so we were quite successful and our our sort of the, the cost of our project was probably only just over eight hundred thousand to um ERDF. Obviously, there was match on top of that, so a lot was done in a relatively short uh, space of time. Um, we had a range of activities, but there's one I thought I'd share with you today um, that we worked quite hard to think about um, pitching my products. So this table just shows that we had two of these events over our lifetime where we knew there were developments coming up. So the first one, a big warehouse development, huge, 2.5 million square foot. The second one, a much smaller cafe that we were developing in, in collaboration with Durham um, Council. Um, so for each of those challenges, we'd work with the developers um, and think about key water resource challenges that were existing um, in those developments. So the warehouse, very much thinking about runoff from hard standing, any risks that they were going to produce in the development, uh, pollution, but also water efficiency in the building. Then for the cafe, it was much more about the usage around toilets, thinking about biodiversity, rainwater harvesting. We then put those out to the SME community where they could actually apply to come and pitch um, their products, their solutions into these developments. And all of this was happening at the very much the, the planning application stage. So it was very early on. Um, and then we managed to get a number of SMEs in front of the developers to actually showcase their projects. And we'd have a judging panel that was made up from the developers, some of us at the Water Hub, but also the regulators if that was appropriate. Um, so the warehouse there, we had eight pitches. Unfortunately, none of them were taken up in the original development that we, we'd hoped. But five of the developers went to work on with five of them for inclusion in other projects. Um, with the cafe, we had a bit more, bit more success, so three of the original pictures were followed up, but one of them was put into something else. So again, it was a really relatively um, uh, easy um, process to run, but it was making really good take up of then these solutions into the supply chain and actually being rolled out. I then thought I'd just run through a few examples of the type of products for you. So the first one was working with a company called Suds Planter. They were they developed these planters that they would put into rear yards. So there's, there's a picture of it on the top right then. I know it looks like just a wooden box with some plants in, but there's actually clever bits inside that help the recirculation of water. Um, so we helped them really by um, they were part of a collaborative tender that we worked with Durham County Council to offer. So they actually got investment into their business. They got testing. We actually championed them at Northumbrian Waters Innovation Festival. They were there to showcase their product. And we introduced them to other SMEs um, in the network to then add expertise onto their products. Outcomes from working with us, they got investment into their business, they had this new smart sector collaboration, they got industry feedback, community feedback, which was really interesting, and they could actually evolve their products. Um, and there's a quote there about um, how much they enjoyed working with us. The next example is really I'm changing tack to think about Jumping Rivers, who are analytics company. Um, so these are one of the digital spec SMEs we were bringing into this space. Um, and they developed a new product to actually access and share data records from the Environment Agency. So they're very much updating um, their systems. And they actually got involved with us by attending uh, an EA-sponsored hackathon, um, where we actually shared the data and all these SMEs could come and then play with it and come up with solutions. And then that facilitated some follow-up funding from the EA to actually develop a prototype. Um, but again, the company still came to us for networking events. So the outcomes for them, they were able to access a new market, they developed a new project, they got, sorry, product, um, they had increased investment into their business and they were enabled to grow their business. And again, we've got nice testimonials from them about the support, but really what was key for them was opening up a whole new market for them, which otherwise they wouldn't have been able to access. And the third project, slightly different again, this was Evolto. They are an intelligent design um, company. Now they often provided consultancy and expertise for other people, but didn't really have their own product. Um, so what they've then developed is this new product to actually monitor depth and flow in rivers by actually listening to the sounds. Um, and so they came to us and again, they were introduced to new kind of applications. They attended one of our challenge events. Um, they had networking, they had access to funding streams. Um, outcomes for them, they got this new prototype, 
they were actually then able to apply under a different scheme to work with Durham University to resource a PhD student who's then out testing the product, getting the validation um, for them to actually improve it uh, and increase their TR levels. And then that product hopefully will then be new to market. And again, again, what they really enjoyed was I think this new knowledge, accessing this new knowledge so they could turn their solutions into a, into a new market. And there's actually a video on them on the website about um, the work they've done with us. In terms of benefits to the partners, um, we, we did canvas all our partners to see um, what, what they enjoyed about this project. Now we put um, Northeast LEP on there as well because they weren't involved in the match funding but they were big supporters and very helpful and actually they found it was helping them as well. Um, so that first column on the left hand side there, very much thinking about um, the types of benefits and this is just a very high level um, table of them. So engagement with us, definitely about growing the bet breadth and depth of active relationships for all our organisations is really important. The second one, thinking about new strategic relationships, sometimes that might have been at an organisational level, but again, sometimes that was very uh, much at an individual level. Um, <clears throat> we also had actual new interventions, which were helping all of the organisations involved deliver their strategic plans in different ways. Um, which they all uh, really enjoyed and, and were really keen. And, and as in light of this, we have got demonstration projects in communities that all of the organisations can point to. But also influencing that product development through sharing their expertise, I think they found very valuable. So outcomes really of what we managed to deliver, and these very much come from a summative assessment that we've had done, and it was slightly before the end of the product, uh, the project. So um, we hope they were better than this in the long run. So. Increased turnover of SME beneficiaries by 46%, increased R&D spend in the SMEs that we work with by 121%, um, increased employment by 14%, and a delivered return of at least £6.80 for every pound of ERDF funding. Now, this summative assessment, the way the rules are of ERDF funding, that's done on the regional basis. So we know from analysing our network that we've had many SMEs that have come from outside of the region as well. So really, we'd say this is a probably an underestimate of what we've delivered. Um, we now have a, a business development grant with the North East LEP about trying to develop a, a working business model for the North East Water Hub going forward now that funding is finished. We've got a couple of academic papers out of this. Um, as well, which again, as a university, we're quite pleased about, but, but we realise most of the beneficiaries for this are not the research environment, they're much more the SMEs and, and the regional economy. And we've contributed to then um, reports like the Bricks and Water, which is a, a Westminster Sustainable Business Forum inquiry. So it's been a really successful project all round. Um, and, you know, the funding has been vital for us, the economy, the SMEs, um, and we just wanted to share that with you. Right, so that's everything from me, um, and I'm going to pass over to Carl now um, for his um, section. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, so just carrying on from Louise, I just have a few few minutes. I'll just give you some headline uh, figures uh, and numbers of a second uh, ERDF funded project uh, in, uh, in Durham, County Durham. I'll just share some of my screen. I have a few slides that uh, I will run through. Okay, so hopefully you can see uh, those slides. So this, this project, COAST, uh, it's a collaborative outreach in applied surface engineering technologies, COAST. And uh, really, just as an overview, uh, as I already said, this is an ERDF-funded project. And it's with uh, Durham, between Durham and CPI, so that's Centre of Process and Innovation, which actually is, is in, in County Durham in Sedgefield. But they're a part of uh, the manufacturing catapult that some of you may be uh, familiar with. So it's quite, it's quite a large project, it's four and a half million uh, overall with two, two, just over two and a half that coming from, uh, from ERDF and the rest from the uh, Durham and, uh, and CPI. But the whole idea of the project was really to support high technology, high growth SMEs uh, in the region and perhaps attract others in. So we have um, Net Park in the region. So this is a high high technology park. It's really to try to encourage uh, those high growth SMEs into uh, into the region and other startups, perhaps to establish a base uh, in that uh, technology park. But really, what we were working on was looking broadly at nanoparticles, um, their their application in coatings, surfaces, composites, and there's a whole range of SMEs out there working in this or very closely related uh, areas. And we were able to support 68 SMEs 
Uh, they were mainly in County Durham as part of our target. So that's the trans translational area there. 80% were from County Durham and then 20% from other regions uh, in the UK. We work to a very similar model as Louise, and Louise has gone through uh, a lot of that, how we work with those partners uh, in, in Durham and, and Durham University. We, we had a 12 hour cutoff for working with our SMEs, so that's a minimum of 12 hours for those 68 uh, SMEs. And we've just had our uh, final uh, external audits are also coming to an end uh, for our project. And it was, it's very good to see our external validation of the project. It's, it's always nice to have, we don't always do that, on UKRI funded projects but having these external uh, agencies in to have a look at the project and do a deep dive was actually very revealing so we, we, we did create 29 direct jobs uh, with the project and 20 further 26 indirect jobs and uh, estimated to have a GVA around at 3.9 uh, million which perhaps as a, as a value of GVA is, is quite small but this is early stage business that we're talking about here so actually it's it's not too bad but more important it's the jobs created that we were quite uh, impressed with and then really um, I only have a few minutes so I, I just want to go through some of the key messages and these are messages that actually were from our SMEs our partners and these are things they came up with when they were actually interviewed um, by the uh, the external auditors and it's, it's always good to know that the SMEs that we worked with would recommend the program uh, to us and that was very important uh, to us um, but one of the key messages actually we took from the program the SMEs really, really valued was the progression of the technology readiness uh, levels. And that's something that I'm, I myself have been quite interested in and tried to, to work on. And it is perhaps is a gap uh, in, uh, in between universities working with companies and companies really getting uh, what they want. So S SMEs were, were able to progress uh, really from that sort of three to four level up to five as we go into that valley of death. But Technology readiness levels in a university typically are one to three. Then, as you progress out of that, it's it's quite hard in that four, five, and six, and then going all up to nine is where you're getting your uh, your your products uh, out. And what we really found was the SMEs that we engaged with actually needed help at that ver very early stage of, uh, of of TRLs, and that that really is avail only available uh, in uh, in universities. Large companies really don't have the time to engage in that level of activity. So really, it does rely on uh, universities getting involved with those SMEs to really help them over that uh, initial hurdle. So they really, really did value uh, that. Something else that, that the, the partners that we worked with really valued was actually just having access to Durham University. So the expertise and facilities, this perhaps is something that we didn't really anticipate. We got involved with it. We just thought, well, we'll just help them with some initial product uh, development. But actually just having access to us as an institution talking to people within the institution. They, they really uh, enjoyed that and they felt that it validated some of the things and their concepts uh, that they were working on. And so that was really good at here. And we're quite keen to uh, progress that with, uh, with certainly our local industries and local partners. But uh, elsewhere you can see on the, uh, the, the last point, um, we actually were able to leverage additional funding for many of the SMEs that we were working with. And to, to date and more in the pipeline, they've secured uh, over four and a half million additional funding uh, on the back of coast to continue to work on their projects which is really really good and just just to really just to finish it, it's essential for programs like coast um, to, to work with SMEs and for universities to work with SMEs and that operating at those low TRL levels is extremely important and I just can't really emphasize enough and that can really only be achieved uh, working with universities and I, I have a background with uh, SMEs and I have an SM, a small company uh, my, myself but working with universities absolutely vital and innovation uh, really does happen at that in within those SMEs and that's something across the UK that we're, we're very very good at and even the northeast we're very very good at and we need to find ways of keep supporting these SMEs and giving them access uh, to at university so I'll, I'll leave the rest for Q&A's and I'll just hand back uh, to uh, to Claire and I'll stop sharing my screen okay well first of all thank you very much um, to all of our speakers for really interesting presentations um, we've been asked to, as to whether they will be sharing the slides absolutely yes um, and along with a briefing note of some of the key points and we'll also aim in due course to put the recording of the meeting out as a podcast or video. 
Um, so I'm going to kick off with a question around territorial integrity, if I could, to start with. Um, Professor Morgan, you talked about territorial, territorial integrity in your presentation, and clearly one of the major tensions is that is the final point you raised over who manages the fund. UK government or the devolved institutions and or local councils. To what extent do you think that this is an existential threat to devolution? Well, I think it is a I think it is a real threat to the devolved settlement because economic development, as you know, Claire, is a devolved competence. And um, uh, and the first minister in Wales and Nicola Sturgeon in, in Scotland have both written joint letters to the prime minister saying that uh, they feel that um, this has been a power grab that undermines the devolution settlement. Um, and I, I fear that although the shared prosperity fund is, you know, it is not a huge budget in, 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 in UK terms, it is a kind of totemic issue, just like fisheries is a totemic issue in the negotiations with the EU, you know? its political significance is way greater than its financial significance for, for various reasons. And therefore, I fear that uh, unless this shared prosperity fund governance issue is resolved satisfactorily, I fear it will, it will fuel uh, Scottish independence and it will boost Welsh independence claims as well. And therefore, it's not unthinkable or alarmist to talk about the breakup of Britain. It really isn't alarmist any longer to talk about these things, especially when the Welsh First Minister is talking like this, and he's an incredibly sober, judicious politician. Thank you very much, um, Professor Morgan. I'm going to do direct a question at Professor Bracken, if I, I could at this stage. Um, you highlighted really interesting and valuable projects funded through the European Development Funds, but the average citizen um, probably has little understanding of these projects or the benefits they bring. And there's clearly a need to increase public understanding of these benefits. Is that the responsibility of universities, governments, or citizens themselves? Um, the lovely question. Um, I'd probably say all three. Um, I mean, one of our tenders that we delivered for Durham City Council was very much was in collaboration with Environment Agency, but it was very much in collaboration with local people as well. Um, so we actually put out a whole suite of sustainable urban drainage solutions. So those included tree pits, new curbs, those planters that I showed. Um, and actually it only worked because all, all of the organisations, and I'm going to say including Northumbrian Water as well, were involved because it was so complicated. You know, when you dig up the streets, you've got to actually then have admission from highways. You've got to make sure you're not damaging the sewer network. Um, but the community, we were working a very deprived community. Um, they had a lot of work going on about um, from other projects about improving the look of their villages and solid wall insulation. Um, and they, I mean, they really got it. They really wanted to be involved, um, which was brilliant. And, and it, but we had some interesting feedback because some of them loved the planters when they got them put in their backyards um, and they tended them, they thought they were beautiful. Um, about somebody else absolutely hated it because they didn't realise that it would need work um, to tend and to, to upkeep. So in the end, that, what their plants had got moved to the community centre, um, which was great in terms of greening for more people, I suppose. But we were quite surprised because you thought actually we, we all, our assumption was they were quite nice, they were quite attractive, <laughs> they were really good things to have. Um, so um, we need to have engaged communities, I think, um, and we, we need engaged um, organisations, I think. So I, I think it's a bit of all of us. And, and universities, I think we have our part to play um, in translating our research. And I think hopefully they're good examples that we've all presented today. Thank you. Do Professor Morgan and Professor Coleman want to come in on that question? Really just to echo what Louise has uh, said really that yes I think it requires all, all of us to be involved at that level for, and certainly for COAST we did an outreach uh, event as part of a, a science uh, festival that we have in Durham and it was really good just getting that awareness out there of nanotechnology and products and what it can do for, uh, for people well, was great. Actually some really good engagement uh, at that level with, with people at that, at that festival. So yes, I, I think everybody has a part to play uh, in it. 
Okay. Um, and perhaps a more specific question for you, um, Professor Coleman, which is um, you highlighted that universities are better placed than private industry to realise wider regional benefits from this sort of funding. To what extent do you think this is appreciated by government? Oof, that, that's a really good question. I, it, P p my own personal view on it that there's, there's a gap for, for SMEs that, that there are routes for SMEs to get support um, but that there's, there's still quite a clear uh, gap there and, and certainly we know from the work that we've been doing a lot of the, the more the recent innovation ac across many sectors many fields actually happens in these SMEs and it, it's really because they're focused on carving out a new market a uh, new product that, and they have to really compete with the established players and so they're forced to innovate so innovation is really forced upon SMEs that, that, that at the early early level and, and large large entities that are very well established have a captive market they, they don't feel the same pressures to innovate so I, absolutely if you want to push things along and grow things you, you have to start at the SME level uh, with that with, with that innovation thank you I'm going to throw out a question to the panel, a uh, final question here for the panel. Um, some of the commentary around the Internal Market Bill has suggested that future regional development funding might be allocated towards the so-called red wall seats, essentially, uh, as an electoral bribe, I think, is some of the suggestions. To what extent is that actually possible if, as Professor Morgan said, funding will be allocated on either a needs-based or a challenge-based formula? Is this just scaremongering? So I just want to see if anybody would like to try and... Sorry, if, if, the, if the fund is entirely allocated on the basis of challenge funding, open competitions, there's no way that a government can, can, can guarantee that the funds go to any particular place, whether they're red wall or, 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 or otherwise. And that may be why the most likely outcome would be some kind of hybrid model whereby we'll see a mix of both needs-based formula funding with a small reserve held on the side for challenge type funds to engage in, 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 in novelty, as Carl said, to promote uh, uh, innovation among SMEs, for example. This is one of the holy grails of regional policy throughout the European Union. How, how do you promote innovation in the SME population? And one of the lessons from the research, it seems to me, is that firms learn best from other firms and therefore we need to craft we, we need we need to craft these we need to craft these um these kind of um peer-to-peer -peer learning networks thank you um for that response um i think louise bracken has gone off the call i'm not sure whether that's a she's dropped off or um professor coleman do you have anything to add because if not i think i'll bring this to a close no, not really. I, I think uh, Kevin has said a good point at the end there about the peer-to-peer -peer learning with SMEs. And we did find with our stakeholder events and actually getting SMEs together, that was really, really uh, beneficial. Okay, well, first of all, a thank you again to our panellists um, and to our audience. Um, we will share the slides, we'll share a podcast at a later date, and we'll be back in touch with further webinars that we're organising. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this morning, and I hope very much it was useful. I certainly found it extremely valuable, um, and that this debate is just beginning, I think. So thank you, everyone.